This is the last segment of Law Day Live, so thank you for being here with us this week. And uh, today, the guest, my guest, is Barry Lewis. He is a criminal defense attorney, and he is here to answer all your questions about criminal law. Um, welcome, Barry. Thank you, Eleanor. I'm looking forward to some questions that will uh, be provocative and helpful to the public in general. And uh, in the meantime, let's get started. Okay, great. So we're going to start with just some simple questions, um, questions that seem to be on a lot of people's minds all the time. And let's start with something, something simple like speeding. Okay, so what are the general increments and punishments for speeding? Well, up to 25 miles an hour over the speed limit, it's a petty offense. It's a business offense. It's something for which you cannot be sent to jail. There can be a fine, there can be a substantial fine, and there are court costs, which uh, in the last few years have become quite severe. Uh, in order to get supervision, you're paying $194 in court costs in Cook County, as an example, and similar large numbers throughout the state. Once you hit 26 miles over the limit, mm -hmm. you're, you can be charged with a Class B misdemeanor. And from what I've seen, it is universal to charge it as Class B misdemeanor. And that is a serious offense punishable by up to 180 days in jail, up to a $1,500 fine. And once you hit 36 over the limit, you're now in the range of a Class A misdemeanor, and that's punishable by up to 364 days in jail, $2,500 fine plus court costs. And it becomes much more difficult as those numbers increase to get it reduced to a petty offense. Now, if you get reduced to a petty offense, then you're no longer charged with a crime. You're no, if you get convicted of it, you're no longer convicted of a crime. But the penalties are getting much more severe. If you get a speeding offense that's reduced to a petty offense, or originally was a petty offense, you can get supervision, but the state's attorney's offices in general keep records of who got supervision and you can't get supervision in general uh, more than once in every two-year period. After that, it's a conviction. If you're convicted, it then goes on the record to the Secretary of State. Your insurance rates can go up. And three moving violations in the space of a year is very likely to get your license suspended for a period of time. And so with respect to speeding, does, this, does speeding ever reach the felony level or it, it will remain misdemeanors? Speeding alone never reaches the felony level. Okay. Speeding while fleeing and eluding can. Okay. Speeding alone will not reach the felony level. Speeding Correct. Speeding combined with something else may reach the felony level. Yes. Okay. And uh, when you're talking about three speeding tickets in a year would result in suspension of your license, let's say that happens to you. Is there a way to get your license reinstated? How does that work? It's a suspension, so your license gets automatically reinstated after a period of time. Okay. I should add, though, if you're under 21, two moving violations in the space of two years will get your license suspended. And that suspension is typically for a year? No, it's typically for a few months. Okay. When you're under 21? When you're under 21, I haven't seen that many of them. The last one I saw was six months. Okay. Now, when you're an adult and you get the three within a year and you, if your license is suspended, typically that suspension period is a year? Yes. Okay. All right. And let's move on while we're talking about driving. Um, oh, wait. I do have one more speeding question for you because it's probably something that a lot of people want to know, and that is what is the best way to get out of a speeding ticket? I'm sorry to say this. The best way is to not get one. <laughs> the fact is, radar's gotten very accurate, LIDAR's gotten very accurate. The days of the police officer casing you behind mm -hmm. uh, are pretty much gone. What happens now, uh, though, is they have a moving radar, and one way to attack it is to say that while they've tested their radar with the devices while the vehicle is not moving, they haven't necessarily tested the compensatory devices that compensate for the speed of the police vehicle. Sorry, that's a little complex, but basically the police have the burden of showing, or the state attorney or county prosecutor or city prosecutor has the burden of showing that, your, uh, that the radar or whatever electronic means of detecting your speeding uh, was accurate. Faulty? They have the burden of showing it's accurate. We have 
uh, the burden then of responding, showing okay. that it's faulty. Now, that would be after a ticket is issued. Yes. Do you have any advice for on the spot, before oh. the ticket is issued, how to get out of a ticket? Well, yes. Uh, first of all, courtesy of the officer goes a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, the officers really uh, want to use these stops to investigate crime more than simply pulling somebody over who's not threatening danger to anyone, not weaving in and out of traffic. So if you're just speeding 15 over and they check your license, find it's valid, and you're, yes, your officer, no officer, thank you, officer, you're far more likely to get a warning ticket than have to go into court. Anything else? I can't think of anything else, okay. really. I mean, just being nice goes a long way in this context. Yes. The police really aren't that interested unless they're under a severe quota requirement, which is rare now, uh, because the, the burden of getting money out of speeders has been moved to these automated cameras. Okay. Uh, as a result, the officers really don't have a great deal of burden in most cases to write tickets, and they are using it as an investigative uh, device. For example, the Oklahoma City bomber was caught as a result of a speeding ticket. Oh, this is something that's okay. forgotten because he wasn't caught immediately, but the FBI released a description of what they thought the person who was the offender would have been like, how he would behave. Okay. And one of the officers in the vicinity, uh, maybe 100 miles away, said, you know something, I stopped a guy who meets that description to a T. Okay, okay. So um, it's really, speeding is something that may lead to something else. Um, but it is not a quota thing, or you're saying, as much anymore, okay? And yes. being nice and professional takes you a long way. Yes. Just like, I guess, life in general. Also, frankly, how you look, you know, are you, it's not just your verbal behavior uh, and outward appearance. It's, you know, do you look respectable or do you mm -hmm. look like a bum? I'm afraid that has something to do with it, too. Okay. I don't want to get into the racial aspects, okay. but there are racial aspects to this as well. Okay, so perhaps we can touch on that on a different time. Okay, so, Barry, while we're talking about driving, let's talk about texting while driving. This is kind of a hot issue. Um, is the rule that there is to be absolutely no texting whatsoever while driving? That's correct. Unless you're parked with a vehicle in park, you can't, cannot text. Well, actually, you can have a, text, a speech to text device hands free. Okay. That uh, some of those work excellently, and you, you can use that, but you can't be reading the texts. Okay. And so when you say, okay, there's absolutely no texting whatsoever unless you're in park, what if you're at a stoplight and you're not in park, but you're not moving? I put my car in park and text. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> answer I could give you. Okay. The, the law does say uh, use park. Okay. Obviously, there's a problem with that. You might be a little late at the light to get going, but okay. yes, that. That's you the way to go. Ticket. Okay. And um, what is the punishment for getting caught breaking that rule if you are caught texting while driving? It's just a fine uh, and get supervision. It's a petty offense. And the same rules for, uh, as for speeding apply. Okay. Okay. And let's see. Um, and while we're talking about texting, you had mentioned hands-free. Um, but going hands-free is fine with your cell phone, whether it be texting or on the phone, something like that. Yes, there are signs I've seen that say um, no cell phone use or no electronic device usage in the um, uh, work zone, the traveling work zones in the expressways. You mean a sign like that applies to hands-free as well? No cell that's phone That's what they're implying, but okay. uh, that's not the law. Okay. The law is that hands-free is okay? Yes. Okay. So while we're on the subject of driving, let's talk about another hot topic issue, red light cameras, okay? Um, with respect to an intersection that has a red light camera, does there have to be a sign prior to entering that intersection that alerts people that it's a red camera intersection? There does have to be such a sign. The law specifically says that. Okay. It must provide a warning with sufficient time, et cetera, to, for the person to know that there's a camera there and stop. Okay, so if there were no such sign you and you somehow got a ticket, that would be reason to get the ticket dismissed? Yes, Okay. although obviously that would be the case, except that the statute doesn't actually make it a defense on a red light 
ticket. The oh, only really? defense yes, if you look at the defenses, mm -hmm. there's only a couple plus something else that's added by virtue of local laws. Okay. And one is that you didn't enter the intersection, I forget what the other is. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that says specifically about the absence of a sign. Okay. Now it just stands to reason that if the sign is required, without the sign, mm -hmm. you can't uh, the ticket wouldn't be valid. Okay. All right. So, and if there were um, no sign, it would be as, in trying to get your ticket dismissed, taking a picture with your phone and bringing that to court and showing it to judge? Right. It would be that simple? Okay, great. All right, with respect to red light tickets, okay. is there a limit to that? And what I mean is, um, like you were saying that three speeding violations in a year gets you suspended. What is the deal with red light tickets, if any? Well, there's a problem. The red light tickets uh, don't determine who the driver is. So it gets treated slightly differently than something where the driver is known. Okay. And the rule is you can get a suspension after five unpaid tickets for red light cameras and SITMAR. But that means all you have to do is pay them and you go scot-free effectively. Just pay the fine and your license can't get suspended. No, there's. N I haven't found anything in the statutes that says that even a hundred of those will get your license suspended. Sure, it will be expensive, mm -hmm. but you can keep on driving. And when you paying those red light tickets is the equivalent of admitting guilt? No, uh, this is something that's just related to the vehicle, and it's a little bit like admitting guilt, paying your parking tickets. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It means that the vehicle was in the wrong place at the wrong time? <laughs> Fair to say, yes. Okay, okay. And, um, okay, so signs aside, um, if one gets a red light ticket and one would like to um, combat that, what would be the best way to go about that? Well, these, a red are, light ticket, these are handled at the village or city level. Okay. So you actually have to, you don't get a court date assigned, you have to request one, you have to contest the ticket, and then they will assign you a date to go into the village hall or to, in Chicago it would be the 400 uh, Superior Avenue building and plead your case. One thing the law does provide, and you should do this if you intend to contest the ticket, is to, the law does provide that you have to be afforded an opportunity to review your uh, ticket on the video screen. Okay. Some sort of method like that. Well, do that first. There also have to be two pictures, you know, basically to show that you entered in the red. It's not sufficient to enter on a yellow. That wouldn't be a violation. And then the problem is, in place of paying $100, you wind up spending an hour or two on a visit to the local village hall or what have you. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case that's up in front of a judge, it's some village official that has the authority to dismiss that ticket? Often you can, in a lot of the villages you do get transferred to a judge. In Chicago you get uh, basically what's called an administrative law judge. He's a retired state's attorney, retired uh, lawyer who makes a little money uh, doing these hearings. Okay, okay, good to know. Um, let's talk about field sobriety tests and DUIs. Um, is it okay to refuse those field sobriety tests if you're pulled over? Not only is it okay, I highly recommend and it. And why is that, Barry? Because, can I be blunt, I couldn't perform them on this perfect surface. And about 20 years ago, I went to a parking lot uh, where my client was supposed to have performed the standard field sobriety test and could not pass them in broad daylight in perfect health, completely sober, because the ground was too rough. It was impossible to balance and walk on a straight line. Now, the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, that's the eye test where he moves his finger across, that will show a positive at about half the uh, blood alcohol level that is a violation. So you could have could be completely sober, have one drink, and still violate that. Not to mention there's about 100 other causes of horizontal gaze nystagmus. In terms of other people 
passing or failing the test. I once had the opportunity of cross-examining an officer at greater length than most judges would allow because the officer was trained differently when he was an MP in the Army versus when he was uh, a state trooper. And so I was able to exploit the differences in that training to, uh, in an attempt to defeat the case, which I was ultimately successful at. However, in the training, the officer testified that they had, oh, half a dozen or a dozen people at various levels of intoxication come into the room and do the Stanfield sobriety tests. And guess what? Every single officer in that training program failed every single person, even though some of them had a blood alcohol level measured of 0 0.08, the minimum. They did not test anyone to see if they could pass it or if the officers viewed them as passing at 0 0.06 or 0 0.04. The problem is those tests are just about impossible for a middle-aged person to pass. So there's no penalty for refusing them, and they should be refused. There's no, there's no penalty for refusing a field sobriety test? None whatsoever. Oh, okay. So I guess that's something a lot of people don't know. Correct. Okay, so, all right. Um, let's talk about DUIs a little bit. And uh, if stopped by an officer, what can the officer legally require the driver to do? The officer can legally require the driver to get out of the car. Failure to get out of the car can be treated as obstruction of police, obstruction of justice, crimes like that. Okay. He cannot legally require you to do the Stanfield sobriety tests. Okay. He can legally ask you if you've been drinking. Furthermore, he doesn't need to give Miranda warnings until he has decided to focus in on you as a likely arrest. Okay. He can legally stop you for any erratic driving or any violation of the laws. He can't stop you simply because he doesn't like the way you look. Maybe it happens, yes. Okay. Anything else that the officer can legally require a driver to do? Once he decides he has probable cause, he can legally require you to come down to the station. You cannot refuse that. He can legally require you to be requested to take a breath or urine or blood test. He cannot force you to take it, but if you refuse upon a proper and legal formatted request, that is evidence that you are intoxicated and is also grounds for suspension of your license. As a first offender or refusal uh, causes suspension for one year. There are ways around that. As a second offender, defined mm -hmm. as somebody who had a previous refusal within five years and some other bases, your license is suspended for three years and there are no ways around that other than to get a judge to agree that the stop was improper or the request to take the test was somehow improper. Okay. And there is no relief from that whatsoever. I want to emphasize that. Your license is suspended for three years and any driving while your license is suspended is subject to possible jail time. In fact, after a second time, it's mandatory jail time. Okay, okay, good to know. Okay, let's move on from driving for a moment and let's go on to the subject of drugs, illegal drugs and parents and their children. Um, a lot of parents, unfortunately, will find illegal drugs in their children's bedrooms. And what do you advise to be done in those situations? Just flush it down the toilet and it's time for a lecture to the kids. And that, and why do you advise that? Doesn't that that may seem to a person to be too lenient? Well, what are your options? You really don't want your child to go to uh, uh, a criminal prosecution. You don't want the child to have an arrest record. You don't want the consequences of that. If you send the drugs to a licensed agency for testing, that may be a problem in and of itself. You've possessed them, you've sent them. What's your explanation? My kids had it. The only people can legally send drugs for testing are basically attorneys and prosecutors and uh, prosecutorial officials such as police. So your options are limited and the best thing to do, talk to them and get rid of the, uh, the Okay. misspoke. 
And let's talk about, while we're on the subject of substances, let's talk about alcohol. Um, what is the risk if parents allow the use of alcohol in their residence by minors? And by the way, minors is specified as someone who is 17 and under. Is that correct? Uh, for this purpose, I think it's 21. For alcohol, it'll be 21 and under? Yes. Okay, so, I mean, under 21, 20 and under. Yes. And so, if parents were to allow that, then what are the consequences of that? It depends on the circumstances. Any kind of uh, religious uh, use of the alcohol is fine. Okay. Uh, the parents can let their children have alcohol in their presence, you know, such as a glass of wine with dinner. There's no penalty for that whatsoever. Okay. It's problematical if you've got friends over and it's not a religious service because it's, the law basically says that you can, parents can let their kids have alcohol in the home under their supervision. Then you get into problems, though, when the parents leave and the alcohol is available. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no responsibility for that if the kids break into your alcohol and take it and you don't know about it at the time. But you get into major problems when the parents are home and you can actually, if somebody dies as a result of that, you can actually, as a parent, be charged with a felony. And if nobody dies, it can still be a Class A misdemeanor, just for serving or knowingly serve, or allowing a minor to leave the home intoxicated. Okay, and so with, if a parent is home and the liquor cabinet is broken into, then what are the ramifications of that kind of situation if the children and or friends um, imbibe that alcohol and get intoxicated? The, the kids are responsible themselves. If the parents don't know about it or have reason to know about it, which is another standard that's mm -hmm. a little more vague, the parents don't have responsibility. Okay. Believe me, I'm a parent. I know that things happen. Okay. And so you're talking I try to both. Avoid it. So you're talking both as an attorney as and, and as a parent in that in that respect. Well, the kids are grown now. Somehow so. they survived. Okay, good, good. Now, what in an alcohol uh, twenty and under alcohol situation as described? What are the circumstances for the child? Well, for example, if you get into a bar by using a false ID your license will be suspended by the Secretary of State. Your driver's license will be suspended. After doing that just once? Even just once. Okay. Um, it's the old, if the tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it. Okay. Uh, is the situation there. There's and what no do you mean by that? Unless this comes to the attention of the authorities, there are no consequences. It's illegal to serve minors in any way. It's illegal to buy alcohol to serve to minors, but and it's illegal for minors to be drinking. And that's just a low-level misdemeanor offense at worst, and often just treated as a ticket okay. in most of the suburbs. It's not a jailable offense? No. Okay. Not in general. Okay. No. Let's talk about alcohol. Now, it's, this is not a minor parent situation, but let's talk about alcohol uh, for adults um, out in public. And public intoxication can be an issue. Um, you know, the weather is getting warmer now. People are out and about. With, when it comes to public intoxication, is it against the law to have an open cup of alcohol while you're walking around on the sidewalk? Yes, even if you're not intoxicated. Okay. The trouble is proof. And what do, do you mean by that? Well, how do you prove that this glass is a Coca-Cola or a rum and Coke? How do you prove it's orange juice or Gatorade versus orange juice and vodka? Okay. Well, if you're walking around with a bottle, that'd be different. Okay. And a bottle in a plastic bag that, or a paper bag, that doesn't work. Okay. It's just a little too obvious what you're hiding. Okay. Does your behavior have anything that may uh, sway the authorities toward be, that being alcohol or not alcohol? Sway is a very good word for that. Okay. And um, could you go into a little more detail with respect to that? Well, public intoxication is also illegal. Okay. And again, that's a very minor offense, but the police can take you into custody for that one. Okay. I've not heard of anyone actually getting jail time for it, but they can take you into custody basically for your own protection. And what if a person commits, uh, becomes publicly intoxicated on more than one occasion? Um, you know, repeat arrests in this respect. What would happen to that person? Well, it's pretty much the same thing each time. It's a revolving door. I've not heard of anyone actually getting a jail sentence for repeated public intoxication. 
Uh, that can also be treated as a mental health issue, though, and as a result of this repeated intoxication, you can um, wind up with an involuntary commitment situation, but that's rare. It's unfortunate, but as a result of alcohol use, half a million people a year, according to statistics, die in America alone. Okay. That's a, sorry, that's 100,000, it's 500,000 for tobacco. Okay. So those are the legal drugs. Mm -hmm. Le illegal drugs, 10,000. Mm -hmm. There's oh. something wrong there. Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. Mary, I think we've reached the end of our time. Oh, no. So I know the half hour goes really fast. I wanted to thank you for coming here. Barry Lewis, uh, solo practitioner, criminal defense attorney. I wanted to, you've seen this on your screen, uh, also just make a shout out for the Chicago Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service. Uh, if you need a lawyer, you can call them and they will lead you in the right direction to find the legal professional you're looking for. And I just wanted to say thank you for watching. My name is Eleanor O, and on behalf of the Chicago Bar Association, thank you for watching and participating in Law Day Live. And thank you, Eleanor. Always a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much.